Now, how are you doing, everybody? We are the Huddle Breakdown. We are the podcast that looks at the stats and XG of Celtic FC. Thanks very much to Paul John for setting us up and for inviting us on as well. We are here, of course, for three or four very worthy causes, charities, Roch Talk Mental Health, Food Banks, Children's First and Health for the Homeless as well. So I think they have over about 12 grand raised so far. The link is in the description if you want to get involved. If you want to donate some money, please do, because that is what this is all about. We're going to be looking at some of the XG and performance of Celtic uh, teams in the past in the Scottish Cup, but also if somebody hasn't listened to us and if you're a little bit scared of XG, don't worry. I'm an idiot too. I don't like it. I, I don't follow it that much. That is what these two guys on the screen with me, Juco James and Alan Morrison. Guys, thanks for joining me today, first of all. Yeah, thanks. I think James, you know, we can't hear you on your microphone yet. Yeah, so I think James is having a few issues with his mic, so we'll try to get that sorted as soon as we can. So as I said, I'm in the call anyway. I am the idiot off the huddle breakdown. I don't have an analytical mind. I follow football the same way as most people follow football. I watch it with my two eyes and try and make my mind up then. But these two guys on my screens are absolute geniuses when it comes to it. So we set up the podcast a couple of weeks ago, uh, about a month and a half ago now. It's on Twitter. It's on uh, it's on YouTube and it's on Spotify. Anywhere you want to listen to it, you can get it. And we basically break down the games in a performance and analytical way. And I try and explain it as best as I can to people who don't actually follow XG. And that's what we're going to do today, first of all, anyway, for... For people who are new to XG, for people who are new to analytical performance analysis when it comes to football matches, we're going to do a little bit of explainer of what XG is anyway. Alan, firstly, the lingo around XG is a little bit different to what you would normally see when you're talking about football. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it, you know, I think there's a, a huge uh, step forward being taken in the last sort of ten years in terms of how we, you know, explain the game of football. Previously, you know, if you just think about the data that was presented uh, to you, if you opened up uh, the newspaper or you look on the BBC website, you'd see, th you know, things like number of shots and number of corners and number of bookings and very basic things like that. I think you know now, now uh, with obviously uh, increased video and uh, uh, you know more. Uh, uh, science being applied to sport in general, uh, there's an awful lot more uh, events and actions and analysis that can be gleaned from football. And expected goals is probably the most, the best known of those. Essentially, expected goals uh, measures the quality uh, of the, the chances uh, being created. So if you think about taking a shot from near the penalty spot, central to the goal with no defenders near you, your chances of scoring are going to be, you know, reasonably, reasonably high. Whereas if you take a shot from, you know, sort of, let's call it the encham range, sort of 35, 30 yards out, uh, with, with with the whole team defensive t alignment in front of you, you know your chances of scoring are obviously much 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 lower. And really, XG quite simply measures that that aspect. That and so the higher the number, the the better the better quality shots you're actually uh, taking. So you want that number to be as high as you can, really. So that's that's XG. That's expected goals, and that's yeah. probably the first thing that people learn when they're talking about analytical uh, data when it comes to football matches, XG, how many goals you're expected to score in a game and how that ranks against your opponents. First of all, over a, a team and what the team's XG is overall as an average, and then as the yeah. players as individuals as well have their own individual XG. That's right. You can get you can get a lot from it. Not not just not just the the person who's taking the shot, but the person who then has provided the pass that has allowed that shot to happen. And as you say, it's an indication of defensive ability because you know how many xG are you giving up essentially? I mean, what's the xG of the opposition? So that you can get an awful lot from that one piece of data, both in terms of your own team and what it tells you about the opposition. I think you know the the what what the sort of breakthrough with xG um, was really around the sort of betting community. Uh, who found that actually, you know, the old the old cliche in football that the league table doesn't lie, uh, actually is wrong. <laughs> the league table does lie because um, if you use expected goals rather than actual goals scored, it's actually more predictive of uh, future performance. And uh, so there's a lot, you know, the, my, uh, the guy, lad Benham that runs uh, Brentford has made a lot of money in selling market information based on XG to high end betters who basically bet on on using expected goals rather than actual number of goals scored uh, very simplistically, but you use other things as well. Yeah, so explain what that means on the pitch exactly. So what players are you looking at for Celtic at the minute that have a high XG? Because obviously everyone knows Ryan Christie takes a lot of shots, but <laughs> what are the probability of what's his XG looking like because of that? 
Yeah, sure. So you obviously you want your your strikers to have the highest expected goals, and if we look at last season, uh, Edward's expected goals is, uh, as I say, not point six nine. Already, that sounds like a bit of a mouthful, but essentially, think of that as you know, he's he's you'd expect him at that rate to be scoring you know 0.69 of a goal a game. And if you think of that over a season, you know, he's looking at like well over 30 goals for the season based on the quality of the, the shots that he's taking. Somebody like Ryan Christie is, is probably less than half that, about 0.3 of an expected goal per game. Uh, last season, so and and actually, his numbers are going down a bit because, uh, well, two things really one is. Mainly, he's been pushed out wide, so he's not actually in central positions. So, it's a lot, you know, he's not taking as many shots from from central. And, and second of all, is just that Celtic in generally, in general, uh, their XG is down this season on last season. Yeah, and obviously the XG counts for players, but it also counts for chances as well because obviously not every chance is created equal, and you have a better opportunity if you're in the box and there's nobody in front of you, and you just have to tap the ball into an empty net. The XG is obviously higher. Um, so if you want to just explain what kind of things are considered when you're making an XG for a, a goal scoring opportunity and what differences you're looking for. Sure. So, I mean, it's 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 quite sort of basic kind of uh, maths in a sense. And, you know, the closer you are to the goal for a start, the more central you are to the goal. So close, close in, central, your XG is generally going to be higher. And then you've got to consider uh, the sort of the game state at the time. So it's, you know, if you've got you know 10 defenders with you and the ball, let's say it's a corner situation and the ball's broken to you in the box, you've got, you know, a bank of 10 players in front of you. Your XG is not going to be that much higher because you, you because of that situation. You've just got many, many bodies to get through. Uh, whereas if you are uh, on a fast break, for example, so you, you're a counter-attack and it's two against one and, and you're through one-on-one -on -one with the goalkeeper, uh, your XG is going to be that much higher because clearly there's no defense was in the way that could uh, add add a deflection or a block or and what have you. So um, generally, XG from things like corners is quite low because again, you're you're passing the ball into what is. I was going to say an organised uh, defensive area, but we've seen Celtic this season. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not always true, but um, yeah. So, so, so whereas if you, if you again, if you, if you your, your your perfect scenario really is uh, a fast counter attack, few def disorganised defence, central position. As close to the goal as you can, your XG is going to be pretty high. If you're shooting from 30 yards, like I say, with a whole defence organised in front of you, uh, your XG is going to be pretty low. And especially if you're taking it from like out, out wide, it's sort of stupid angles and so forth. So angle, distance, um, number of defenders in the way, game state, these are all the kind of key, the key things really. Yeah, and I think one of the one of the things that people probably throw at XG and say that uh, the reason that it's it's not as reliable as you'd like is probably the Ryan Christie goal, for example. I always bring this up on the podcast, the goal against Aberdeen in the semi-final. That XG would have been very low because there's loads of defenders in front of him. It's at a tight angle. He's far out. But sometimes those shots go in. But one key theme that we've been discussing on the podcast over the last couple of weeks is that XG is actually a better form of analyzing performance over a long period of time so if he takes that shot on in every single game he's not going to score it in every single game and you're going to be wasting opportunities james i heard you laughing there can i hear you now i, I hope so I, I, had to go to a, I had to go to a backup mic so if my sound isn't great i apologize it's all good so it's it's good to have you with us so alan was you could probably hear him explaining xg do yeah. you want to take uh, what xa is yeah, so basically uh, expected assists is the person that passes prior to the shot. I mean, it's really that simple. So the person who makes that pass uh, to the person who's going to get credit for the XG uh, basically gets a value uh, as an expected assist in order to try and gauge uh, chance creation um, over time. So the idea is if you get a player like... Um, uh, James Forrest, who gets into good locations and sets up fellow players, uh, you know, that that's it's really a way of measuring. And that's really I, I just want to put my two cents in on what Alan was saying before is really it, 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 analytics is all about measuring. Um, so the idea with XG, XA, all of these metrics and forgive me, Alan, if you if you cover this specifically, but um, is really it, it's not about um, uh, a better way to play or, you know, these fancy terms that people aren't familiar with or it's confusing and can be intimidating. It's really just an issue of measuring and measuring things um, in a way that tries to um, attribute actual performance levels. 
So that's on a one-off game, as you were saying, and uh, uh, you know, XG is not irrelevant, but as far as the outcome, there's so much variance game to game between actual results and underlying performance because it's as how Alan says uh, brilliantly so often is it's, it's such a low scoring sport um, that you can have shots like the guy from Liv uh, Livingston that, you know, from 25 yards or you get goofy own goals or penalties, red cards, you know, any single game, there's one bad officiating, which is consistent <laughs> in Scotland. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it, it really, it, it's about how do you answer a question? Like, so the, the all of these metrics are really about um, trying to assess performance levels, knowing that, and you have to recognize that on a one-off basis, there's so much randomness and variance that takes place in the game of football that you're going to get games where a team absolutely dominates at, on, in performance metrics and loses. And that doesn't mean that the performance measurements are, aren't valid or worthwhile. Uh, the question is, what, you know, what, what question are you trying to answer? And when we talk about sample size and looking at things over time, that's why these metrics are important. So, um, you know, the, the fact that they aren't uh, directly efficacious in one-off games doesn't mean that there's not validity. It's how do you apply these measurement tools? Um, and go ahead. So just move, just moving on because we want, we're trying to get through as many terms as we possibly can to explain what we're going to be talking about later in the podcast. So XSC, what is that, Alan? So very simply, I know uh, it's expected scoring contributions. Or scoring contribution is how many goals would you be expected to score? How many assists are you expected to uh, create? So it's really uh, XG plus XA is expected scoring contribution. It's really that simple. So that's really looking at attacking attacking output. So, you know, somebody like an Edward, who uh, I think James did some great work last year, showing that in a European context, uh, so this is within the peer group of European Europa League level strikers, uh, you, you, last season, you, uh, Edouard was uh, um, performing at an elite level, both as a striker and as a number 10 simultaneously. Well, number 10 would be the classic sort of Rodgick role where you'd expect a lot of creativity, so high X expected assists. And then obviously striker, you'd expect uh, high expected goals. And uh, Edouard would be an example where his, his score expected scoring contribution was well over, you know, well, actually it was... Uh, one you know one one point two one point two so basically you're saying every time edward for every 90 minutes edward plays you're expecting him to uh, have 1.2 goals or assists which is you know if you've got that in your team that's that's fantastic right when we first started this podcast we were doing up a few graphics to explain some of these terms and explain where the likes of duffy and brown and all these players are and one term that i came across that i i wrote it down as impact but it's actually impact. It's, uh, it's a term that I hadn't actually come across before either. So p pass impact, it measures packing. And do you want to just explain what packing is, Alan? Because it's sure. a term that I'm sure, like me, not many people have heard of. Yeah, so I mean, it's a, it's a German, actually a German company that came up with this concept. And, and they, this was, if you look up impact with, a, with the E, uh, this is the their sort of, uh, their proprietary word, I guess. And uh, they will they will offer consultancy to clubs to, to measure this sort of stuff. But I do it for Celtic games because, you know, it's actually quite simple to do. It takes a long time, but it's, it's simple if you see what I mean. But essentially what you're, what you're measuring is the ability of players to um, take opponents out of the game. So if I, uh, you know, if, if Endo, if you're, if you're in front of me as a defender and I pass to James on the line and you're now uh, basically, uh, the, the ball is now closer to your goal than you are, I've taken, effectively taken you out of the game. So there's one less player opposition player now between the goal uh, uh, and and, uh, and James so that's, that's 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 like something worth measuring I think so uh, there are some people who say that um, kind of d deride it saying you know you might as well just count forward passes you're going to get the same thing but what I think they miss is that there's actually two sides to the transaction there's the passer and the receiver so not only am I measuring my ability to pass forward and, and pick out a teammate I'm also measuring James's ability to find space and receive the ball and then and, and then control it. So there's actually two two quite different skill sets that you're actually measuring mm -hmm. there and giving a value to, as well as the number of players I've taken out the game. So there's a lot of information in that one action that you can you can uh, determine. So re again, you, you, players have got a high uh, sort of packing rate, impact score are really the players that take the most opponents out of the game. Uh, so there, it's, a, it's, it's a good measure of a creativity. So it's got nothing to do with creating chances per se, but it, it, it kind of rewards those players who probably play a little bit deeper back, 
and, and take and take and, and, and get the ball forward to those who can then create the chances. So it's a way of recognizing that contribution because goals and assists tends to kind of um, recognize certain players. But then what about the likes of McGregor, who's like passing the ball all over the place? How, how are we measuring him? How do we know what good looks like? Well, this is one measure that can that you can say what good looks like. So within a Celtic context, if you think, well, who's the who's the elite uh, player at taking players out of the game, essentially breaking opponents' lines with passing? It's actually in Cham. And Cham would lead on this metric uh, for every season that he's been here, apart from this season, which is one of the reasons why uh, you know playing in Cham. One of the many reasons actually why playing in Cham at number ten is such a bad idea is you completely lose that ability to kind of break the lines and take people out of the game. And he's not a very good shooter, so so having him in in promising position centrally is, is, is not a good idea. When you could you could have a Christie in there, for example, who who, who can who, who is a good finisher. But yeah, uh, so that, sorry, James. So um, you've got about twenty years on me. Do you reckon? You can outrun me if the. Well, let's not get into that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm leaving if we're going down that road. <laughs> I, I, I shaved today and put moisturizer on my face. I was expecting <laughs> to maybe close that to about 15, but go ahead. Uh, so, as, as well as you can going stick forward, to turn. <laughs> as well as going forward and having players like in Cham take players out of the game, that all also happens defensively as well. So, defenders can get packed. In. And we, we did one of these uh, analysis on the wing backs. Uh, for for Celtic and Laxalt and Frimpong, and they get packed a lot, so they get taken out of the taken out of the game quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, I think that's uh, Alan's work on this has been excellent, and um, that's where uh, when you look at the structural issues that we've talked about relative to Celtics defending this season, uh, you know, it seems like our midfield regularly has been just wiped out with passes. I think uh, Alan had talked about in a prior show about uh, in the Lil game, uh, in the 2-2 draw, about how just ridiculously high amounts of passes were taking out our defenders. And so this metric is not only one that you can take um, and assess our uh, you know, ball progression uh, in, in midfield, um, but also you know, how is our defensive structure holding up, what kind of um, – uh, organized structure. So that's, it's really a nice proxy uh, for organization shape. You know, that that's teams that have structure and shape and discipline uh, tend to be harder to get packed against. Um, so, you know, some of these things are, um, you know, th there's always this thing in analytics about causation and correlation um, and, and making that distinction. And I think this is one that's a, a definitive situation of, of uh, causation, meaning that when you, when you have poor structure, poor shape, uh, it's not unusual to get packed a lot. Uh, and, and that that's taken place through our midfield and, and fullbacks slash wingbacks. So, so there are just on on that metric, then. So, one one of the really interesting things it tells you, cause it, again, as James says, it gives you insight into not just style of play but level of organisation. So, if you look at this metric over the years, uh, and, and you'll see players like in Cham, you know, McGregor, uh, you know, Christie would all score highly. They tend to be central midfielders who therefore their passes can be, you know, in different directions and not stuck out on the wing. It's difficult to take people out of the game when you're out wide, but if you're central, you've also got a much wider field of influence. So it tends to be those types of players. This season, fascinatingly, um, the top of the top five packers, if you like, in the team, three of them are the centre halves. So what does that tell you? A, it tells you, I don't think we've got the midfield or, or alignment right. We've not got the players in central midfield to make the passes that, that we need to make to break teams down. And two, it's, a, it's as James says, it's a bit of a proxy for saying we're going that little bit more, but more direct. Now, as, with, as we've talked about on the show, having bit, bit on is actually the top pass packer uh, this season. Um, and, you know, bit, playing bit on at centre back against a deep lying team. Uh, you know, one of the lower teams in the SPFL is, is a great idea, and it works really well generally. Playing bit on against the top European team is not such a good idea because um, his defensive play, his anticipation, and his uh, positioning positional play just are not elite level uh, defensively. But again, it comes down to an Ayer Ayer's uh, Ayer's forty percent more pack passes this season than last, um, and Julian's a little bit up as well. And Julian's quite a good long passer, and long passes can can be very effective, and indeed. We'll be talking about the uh, the cup final uh, soon, and last you know the, the last time we played Hearts in the final, both goals were essentially quite long, long passes, 
Um, you know, Hayes released Edward for the penalty and Lustig's famous uh, header from halfway that released Edward for the for the winner. So, so you know, not a, a long pass is just another form of passing, but it does say something about the style. And if Celtic are going more direct, you know, I'm not sure that is a progressive way to to go or, or, the, or the right use of resources either, really. But it, again, it's just another one of the insights you can get from using this metric. So just before we get actually get into the football and into the cup final and look ahead to that, one final one that we want to talk about, our defence have been, has been absolutely awful this year, let's be honest. And Shane Duffy has not hit the ground running the way that we thought he might have um, coming into the side. How do you measure defensive actions then when you're looking at a defender? What's the term for that? Yeah, so I mean, listen, defensive metrics have always been uh, recognised as being more difficult uh, to measure for uh, the sort of stats community, if you like, uh, mainly because a defensive um, play is, is much about you know, sort of corporate organisation about collective collectiveness, and uh, not just you know one person's in the right place, but someone else isn't. Then you know you, you, you potentially be conceding a lot of chances, and that doesn't necessarily reflect well on the person who's always in the right position. But that, you know what I mean. So um, individual actions uh, in relation to defensive play are, are less, are probably tell you a little bit less, I would argue, than than attacking ones. But never, nevertheless, we, we'll have a go. And so we, I come up uh, again. It's not one I invented. I think I pinched it from someone someone else, as you tend to do. Uh, defensive action success rate which is a lovely mouthful is really an aggregation of, of looking at things like the challenges won so it's tackles aerial challenges number of interceptions balanced against things like um the number of those that you're losing the number of fouls you're giving away the number of times you're miscontrolling the ball and giving the ball away etc so, so it's an so it is it's really a lot of defensive actions. It doesn't include passing, so passing's not included. But essentially, what I've found over the years is this defensive action success rate is, is a really, it passes the eye test, essentially, as in if you map the players that have got the high values, it kind of looks sensible, right? You've got Van Dyke, you've got Julian, you've got Ayer near the top, and God bless them, you've got Jack Henry and uh, you know, Effie Ambrose down the bottom. And it, it kind of makes sense if you're thinking about rating your central defenders, for example. Um, this season, uh, it won't surprise you to know that the uh, individual yeah, player... Yeah, so, I suppose... Hi, sorry. The... Think... You still hear me? Sorry, Alan, your mic just cut off there. Do you want to continue? Okay. Yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah. Uh, this season, the defensive action success rates for all our defenders are, are down. Uh, which again tells you a story. It tells you a story about, uh, and as James alluded to, what we're what we've seen with Celtic is a kind of collective uh, weakness uh, around the whole system, which then then tends to drag each individual player's performance down. I mean, Julian is still outperforming uh, all, all the other defenders by this by this measure, uh, and all and and Julian Bitton and and uh, and Ayer are outperforming Duffy, who, who we talked about at a great length as being a player who. Not only is struggling, and we know he's had his reasons, uh, his own personal reasons that he's been struggling with for form, but actually, fundamentally, he's potentially not the right sort of defender to play in a team like Celtic. One last note on defensive action success is it's very good for measuring centre halves, but um, you can't. You, you're best to compare the same players playing in the same position. Outside of the centre backs, the next highest defensive action success rate is Scott Brown, which was 63% last year and it's 63% this year. So incredible consistency. But again, uh, you know, care taken because you might interpret that as being, oh, Brown's being as effective as he was uh, uh, last season. But with Brown, it's, it's a percentage, right? So his percentage of success is the same, but his overall volume, uh, that's against a much lower volume of activity. So he's still winning the same number of challenges, but he's, he's making an awful lot less of them. And that's that's why you've got to be very careful when you to use any of these metrics in isolation. You need to probably take a, a sort of basket of these to, to form more of a nuanced uh, sort of story and narrative. Yeah, so we broke down these figures and looked at the defensive side of things and Shane Duffy and what the best sort of formation is and what the best lineup is. If you want to go and listen back to that, you can find us in, on Spotify, on iTunes, on Spreaker and on YouTube as well. We are the Huddle Breakdown, the podcast that looks at the stats and XG of Celtic. And we're here because we want to raise some money for charity. So if you want to get involved, there's a link in the description below and just give whatever you can if you have anything. So we're going to look ahead to the Scottish Cup final now. And the way that we're going to do that is by looking back at the 18-19 final and comparing where the players are now compared to what they were back then. So the starting lineup for that uh, Hearts 2-1 game was Scott Bain and Nets, Mikhail Lustig, Jojo Simonovic, Christopher Ayer, Johnny Hayes, Scott Brown, 
Cal McGregor, James Forrest, Tom Rogic, Mikey Johnson, and Odson Edward. So there's a couple of players that are not in the team anymore, and there's a couple of players that are. So we're going to look at the players who are currently in the team at the minute as well. So you have Chris Ryer, Scott Brown, Cal McGregor. Probably won't do James Forrest because he's not going to play tomorrow. Tom Rogic and Odson Edward. We will probably leave Mikey Johnson off this as well because he hasn't played this year with injury. So where do you want to start here, James? Yeah, so um, I think that the uh, w- one of the things to start with from the game is how close that game was, um, both from a results perspective, obviously a late winner, um, but that was corroborated by the underlying performance metrics. It was um, basically a, a coin flip. Uh, both both teams were very limited. It was, as I say, there wasn't much in the game. Uh, I think there was maybe seven shots for Celtic, maybe five for Hearts, plus or minus one there. I'm going off memory there. Um, and out, outside of obviously seven, the six. seven six, is that what seven, it was? Yeah. Seven six. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, that's fine. Yeah. And, that, you know, that gets into this. I, you know, uh, even when, when you're talking about data, it, it, there's always some degree of, of uh, subjectivity. Right. So uh, what's a shot? You know, when is it a shot? When is it a shot? You know, if if it deflects off a guy's shoulder and he didn't really mean it, is that a shot? You know, so it depends on how you characterize it and how you define it. Uh, um, So again, back to this idea, it doesn't mean that it's invalid to measure it. It just means that there's different ways to do it and and being aware of it, that uh, those, those nuances is important. Um, so yeah, outside of the, the, the penalty from Edward, I mean, there weren't a lot of great chances in, in the game, uh, from either side. And that, that comes back to this issue of cup finals and how they're often, uh, you know, kind of played a little bit conservatively. And, um, so even, even though hearts are, are coming out of the championship, uh, I did a thread on this earlier in the week that, um, you know, there's different metrics that you can kind of gauge, uh, team strengths. Uh, one's called ELO, which is actually borrowed from a, 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 a hung, well, not it was founded by a Hungarian American physicist uh, to, to measure chess players. This, the, the the methodology, uh, so it can be done across different sports. And um, if you look at uh, where, where Hearts is in those kind of rankings, they're basically a mid-table uh, Premier team in 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 their relative quality. Which again, I don't think would shock people. Uh, when we discuss it, but, you know, kind of in the Kilmarnock range, uh, even though they went down and, and part of that's because they horribly underperformed their underlying performance metrics last season. Uh, so if you look at their XG and various things last season, when they went down, um, you know, th- there's probably some reasons for that, but uh, so, so they are a better team in quality than you might think coming out of the championship. Um, so, you know, we're, I, I think going in with any kind of complacency and a one-off would be unwise. Uh, we'll talk about probably some of that with lineup selection, that kind of thing. Um, the, the only other concept I'll talk about is just generally, you know, when you have young players, they tend to ascend over time. So we're about a year and a half on from that. So you get young players, if they're developing, they can oftentimes get better uh, in, in, in over a year and a half, whereas you get older players or players in their prime, they typically kind of stay the same or, or maybe get a little worse. Uh, so if you look at the sampling of who played that game and where they're at now, you, know, you can kind of line that up with which players are which and have an idea as far as where you could think their performance levels would be 18 months later. So, Alan, do you want to talk us through the players and where their performance levels are at compared to it? Because I suppose looking back on that season, you would make a strong argument to say that at that point in time, Celtic were a much better side or performing a lot better than they are this season. You you could. I think um, that game obviously was the end of May 2019. So Lennon had just taken over. Um, he'd played Hearts in his first match. Then they played them obviously in the cup final. Uh, and then the following season, uh, there was three matches against Hearts. I think um, Devine got was left maybe through that season and Stendhal came in for the February 5 nil game, uh, which was, was a right laugh. <laughs> that was a good game was there. It was good. But the, the, if, in terms of, you know, what do we learn? Uh, obviously we've now got a different manager again in, in Nielsen, right? So it's, it's, it's going to be a little bit different. I mean, Levine, 
Levine, I'd imagine it's going to be more like Levine than Stendhal, put it that way. So if you look at if we look at those performances, um, the cup final was actually very much like um, the, the first game of the 1920 season, uh, which was Celtic won three one. But if you remember, that was a game where Bio didn't score. He, he thought we all thought he'd scored two, and actually were given his own goals. And, Ce- and Celtic actually only had three shots on target all game, and one and one three one. And the way that um, Levine set up the team and the way that they played was very similar to that cup final, where it, it was a, it was a low block. Uh, and, and and it was a very intense pressing uh, performance that the team put in. Uh, people, you know that cup final, for example, Hearts had committed eight fouls by the twenty second minute, and Column hadn't produced a single yellow card. They were allowed to just foul with impunity and break the game up. They were wasting time actually at throw ins and restarts after five minutes of that cup final. So that's a bit of context to that to that kind of game. Now Celtic didn't didn't play well, and Lustig. Uh, that you know really struggled again. So I think it was Mulraney that was on the on the wing that day. And just when we're talking about you know are the are the teams you know better or worse kind of thing. I think there's no doubt that when we look at the stats that the Celtic players are in are in worse form than they were at that time. You know Edward is Edward's numbers have just gone off the cliff. You know his expected goals is down. Um, you know, nearly sixty percent. As expected, assists is down one hundred and thirty-eight percent. It's just, you know, his contribution is just, you know, um, you know, uh, not what it was. Christie, uh, this similarly, has gone down a bit, but then probably because of positionally where he's being played. But on the other hand, El Yunusi's form is better than it was last season, and Ayeti's actually t- his numbers are really good. I know he's we've only we've not seen that much of him, so you know, how will they line up uh, and how will they play? Uh, is I think uh, you know. Looking at those, looking looking at that historical um, perspective, I, I would I would say that if you are going to pick a defence of Ayer, Julian Duffy, and Laxal, which let's face it, common sense suggests that the, that that defence has played two games, played really well, limited opposition chances, uh, the overall structure has been better. Ayer, Julian Duffy, Laxal to me is probably a better defence than. A uh, regret, a uh, regressing Lustig, Simunovic, Iron and Hayes. Yeah, so, Johnny Hayes playing left back. I mean, <laughs> Johnny Hayes had a great game that day. Don't get me wrong; he was he was one of Celtic's better performers. And uh, as I say, he put uh, Edward through for the pe- for the for the for the penalty challenge. <laughs> let's, let's let's leave it let's leave it at that. Um, but yeah, so I'd actually argue that we we could potentially have a stronger defence than than we did that day. The rest of the team's form may improve if we if we if we stay with the same shape. As we've had in the last two games, I would expect that the performance levels to to be rising really for the rest of the team. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if Neil Lennon actually follows through with what he's been hinting at and starts Scott Brown in midfield instead of Sorrow, or if David Turnbull starts ahead of say Tom Rogic, or what what kind of lineup it is probably going to be. It's going to be a, a tough one for Neil Lennon either way because it's a no win situation if he if he follows through and puts Brown into the same team, then fans are going to be unhappy even if Brown has a terrible game if Celtic go on to win the game. So it's it's going to be that's that's where we're going to wait and see and hopefully Sorrow gets his chance in the cup final. One thing that we spoke about before we came on this is almost the difference between a cup final and league and how you define that because often you hear managers talk about finals and they say that it doesn't matter how you play as long as you win. And that is the case because it's a once-off game and these games only come around once a year when you're in a final. So when you're putting together data or trying to analyse this kind of game, are you looking at it a different way to what you're looking at league performance? Yeah, so th- this is where you get into uh, layers of variance, right? So uh, total geeky way of, of introducing this. So if everyone can, falls asleep now, uh, I apologise. But... Um, so when you have, as I mentioned earlier, as you have, let's say 38 games over uh, a full season in the league, uh, things tend to smooth out. You get what they call mean regression. Things kind of average out over time. Uh, and we talked about earlier how, you know, XG and these other metrics aren't necessarily reflective of results in a one-off game. And as, as you shorten your sample size to one game, you introduce more variance, as I talked about earlier, red cards, you know, own goals, crazy deflections, really anything can happen in a one-off that causes this divergence between underlying performance and, and actual results. So the way I view it um, is uh, 
as I like to say, in one-off games and knockout football, whether it's champions and qualifiers, which this year they were single games, um, or in a cup final, for example, what you I think it's unwise to introduce unnecessary variance, right? So it's 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 it, it it doesn't make sense in a circumstance that already is ripe for variance to then pile on top of it uh, unnecessary uh, additions in in when you're talking about discretionary decisions. Uh, so this is where I come back to Lennon and his track record in knockout games. Um, you know, he, he tends to make decisions that increase variance. He's kind of a gunslinger, uh, 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 a risk taker in certain ways, whether it's, you know, McGregor at left back, uh, Bayer at right back, you know, that it can work both ways, right? So, the, you know, when you take risk and you increase variance, uh, sometimes it works. Sometimes, you know, you bet on 15 and you get 21. Right. So James, James, sorry to interrupt. I was going to give you one example of that against Hearts. Exactly that what you're right. talking about. Which, which, which fans, you may not look at it and think that's a risk, but actually it, it is. And 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 you, you've explained very well why that three-one home game against Levine's Hearts, where again they set out to just stay in the game as long as they could at nil-nil, and then the factors that you're talking about uh, can kick in. Um, that game was where um, he had Christie at right wing. Forest at left wing, and in Cham is ten, and and, and that's just you, you've, you've essentially you've, you're playing all three players out of position to accommodate right. some like, some notion, and that that's and, and 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 they all had terrible games that day, <laughs> you know. And, and, that's, and, 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 it's, and Bayer, it's that kind of thing. It's that kind of thinking that can screw you up, right? Well, and I think that was as you said earlier, that was the game. Bio was a striker too. Yeah, and so, Bio was a, yeah, yeah. And he actually played. By the way, well, the new guy up front. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so those kind of gambling decisions, and when I say gambling, I, I mean that um, they're not necessarily well supported analytically, uh, or you know, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they're bad decisions. It's just that when you have lack of information, like that specific lineup playing that kind of opponent, they literally had no history to even go off of. So that's when I say kind of winging it and gunslinging. And that's the kind of decision and lineup. That you know, so in in a in a regular season game uh, or you know in a, in a league game uh, relative to cup competitions, is that the worst thing in the world to do? Well, no, it, 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 it's you know maybe not my preferred thing, but the cost of maybe drawing in a in a league uh, isn't calamitous. Whereas when you get into knockout games, uh, when the cups on the line or qualifications on the line, um, you have uh, a lot bigger uh, risk factors and costs of making those kinds of decisions. So the, the only other thing I'll add within this context is introducing variance, even if it's unnecessary, it's kind of a discretionary risk that you're piling on top, can make sense when you're the underdog, right? So if you think about control of a game, if I'm, if I'm the definitive favorite going into a game, I want the game controlled. I, I want the quality of my side controlling the game and and basically dictating how we want to play upon the other team. Whereas if I'm the underdog, what I want to do is create chaos. I, I, I want to be Cluj in the 4-3 game, right? And that's what Cluj was good at. Uh, and their style of play against in Europe against better teams is to do exactly that, is to create chaos. And what that does, you know, when you're talking about second balls and you know, things just going all over the place without things being under control. That's basically think about risk. That's that's increasing variance. Mm -hmm. So as Alan was talking about earlier about us maybe going more direct, playing longer passes from the back, from from center backs, um, you know, uh, ha having Brown the focal point of the buildup and the attack. All these things that introduce risk when you're going into play a, a team like Hearts, where we are the definitive overwhelming favorites. Depending on the lineup and the tactics and how we play tomorrow, you can kind of go through a checklist of things that are going to create more variance in the game and uh, potentially, you know, give a team that really has no business having a high probability of winning the game going from, let's say, a 15 percent chance to a 40 percent chance. And 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 that's, you know, that's kind of been Lennon's. Uh, legacy in, in these kind of games because he does kind of do these oddball decisions at times uh and, and they frequently 
you know, increase that risk. And again, to his credit, sometimes they work, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean, you know, it's necessarily a, a good way to go about doing things. Yeah, and uh, just as you mentioned chaos there, I do want to give a shout out to a guy called Felix in the chat who has a Dublin badge as his uh, his thumbnail because Dublin are playing Mayo in the All Ireland final in Ireland Gaelic football t today. But in the build up to that, so b basically Dublin are the machine off Gaelic football. They've won five titles in a row and they're going for the sixth this year. Mayo are the team that have been coming up against them more than often than not in the final and losing. And one of the things that the players talk about going into that game from previous games, like players that have retired, and the, the first thing that they said, that the one thing that they wanted to do in the game was create chaos. Because if you create chaos, then the Dublin players are throwing off what they're supposed to do. And that's essentially what Hearts are going to try and do tomorrow because Celtic are strong favorites. If they play their game, they should win. But if Hearts don't let them play their game, then that's when you start to see their chances and probability crop up and start increasing their their chances of actually nicking a goal or nicking a, a penalty or something like that. Alan, do you want to hop in on that before we move on to Hearts themselves and get some uh, insight into wh where they're at? Yeah, no, exactly on that. So I've just been looking at their lightly sort of team lineup and they've got a very experienced team. So we were talking about, again, you know, variation and the unexpected. I'm not sure there's a lot of unexpected in there in the sense of they don't have a sprinkling of young young players, you sort of, who, who, you know, full of physical enthusiasm and, and, the, and the unexpected. It's, it's a pretty experienced team with the likes of Gordon, uh, Smith, Halkett, um, Herring, Lee. Naismith, you know, Boyce, uh, even even Walker. Walker's probably one of their more creative players. I, yeah, so I, I see their team as having threat down the wide areas. Uh, Walker on the right, uh, Kingsley is a, fo a, a youngster that was um, well, came through the Falkirk system at the time when Falkirk were producing uh, no end of young players that ended up going to England, and he's now back from from Hull at Hearts, which is a bit of a coup for them, I think, because he's a decent decent player, Kingsley. And him on the left and Walker on the right, I think, will cause problems, which is why I, th I like Ayer and Laxo, is they're good defensive fullbacks. And I think Celtic, if they can put enough talent in front, uh, they've got a defensive structure there that's strong on the flanks. Because as we talked about earlier, um, you know, when we play especially uh, a 3 5 2 with Laxalt and Frimpong, um, you know, Laxalt, sometimes you, the ball gets transported to Celtic's left side of defence and you're sort of looking at the screen going, where, where's Laxalt? Literally, where is he? <laughs> he could be anywhere on the pitch. And uh, the packing stats show that actually, you know, Laxalt, Frimpong just get taken out of the game far too easily. But, so I think Hart's main strength is going to come down those two. They, you know, they're a team who obviously have scored a fair number of goals in a weaker league. Um, and the goals have been sprinkled around. No, no one player's got more than five. I think nine players have scored at least kind of two goals. Where, where, I, where I would uh, be uh, optimistic is if you look at that central midfield, if they go with Herring, who's the sort of defensive uh, Austrian player, I think he is, and, and then Ollie Lee is uh, Robert Lee, the old Newcastle player's son. Um, that's not a that's not a mobile front uh, middle two, right? Uh, if you've got Sorrow, uh, you know, and McGregor. Uh, that's a lot. There's a lot more energy there, I think, in the in the midfield and in Turnbull too. So I would be hopeful of dominating the midfield. If we play Brown, that advantage could well uh, be be, be neutralised. So th th I think they've got, a, as I say, I would say uh, an experienced team. I don't think there's going to be too many shocks. I think they'll probably play more like a Levine side of you know let's let's make the game as tight as we can so that we can. Uh, those variance factors later in the game will become more of an issue potentially, uh, rather than the Stendhal. Stendhal's approach was to try and play Celtic off the park, playing out from the back, goalkeeper playing out the back. And that's the game they lost 5 0. And it was a great game of football, but they aren't going to play like that <laughs> tomorrow, I'm pretty sure. James, what's your spread on this? What were you, I know you've done, done some digging on Hearts. So. Yeah, so the, their, uh, their results in the championship are well supported. I mean that they're they look like the the wealthiest team in a the league. Um, they're they lost the, the, sorry, sorry, James. They lost the clutch game away at Dunfermline. They, yeah, yeah, they did. They did right. Um, and and I, I was going to say that was really the only game where they 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 were bothered. Um, and I think that's kind of offset by the the result that they they achieved against Hibs, which again was reasonably well supported with underlying performance metrics. Um, so, you know, th they're playing at a level, like I said earlier, that really is more of a mid-table uh, premiership team. Um, and uh, just to kind of segue on on some of the stuff, pick up what, what Alan was saying, I, I think 
the other aspects of their lineup that I think stand out is that they're they're gonna they they th they've been playing basically either four two three one or four one four one. And again, with the later start in the championship, I think they only have eight competitive matches so far. So you know who knows maybe they'll mix things up going in into uh, into the game tomorrow. But really, when they play the those whether it's one or two sitting uh, uh, midfielders, they're the big boys, right? So they're they're kind of the uh, the six one six two bigger guys. Um, and uh, so when you look at Halkett and Barra, they're not huge center backs. So, uh, and they're not terribly athletic uh, as far as quick or pace or, you know, that kind of thing. So if we do play the lineup that we, we I think, you know, we've had the last two games, um, you know, we should be able to dominate them athletically in the midfield and on set pieces. So this goes back to, uh, you know, if Turnbull plays and we play a lineup like we had the last two games with with those defenders and even with that midfield, I mean, we, we should be a real threat. You know, they don't have anyone six four or six five. Uh, I don't. None of them look to me as if they're big leapers <laughs> that, yeah. from what I've watched. Um, so it's it's going to be Boyce or White, and uh, you know, they're both kind of clever strikers, but they're not. They're not aerial. Yeah, they're not aerial. Yeah, they're not Yeah. So, you know, as far as our issues defending set pieces, so it kind of works both ways. I mean, I, I think uh, if we make kind of solid decisions here, we should, this should be a game kind of like the Comarna game on Sunday, where we can absolutely control the game, dominate the game, and limit their chances uh, to the point where eh, there could be a one off here. You know, we might, might give up a goal. Um, but we should be able to score at least two or three um, if, if, if we're, we're smart about selection. And uh, even if we don't, you know, maybe get all of our tactics the way we might want. Um, the man-for-man man, uh, dominance here should be, from an athletic perspective, should be pretty significant. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that's not to, um, you know, uh, uh, be critical of hearts. Again, they're in the championship. They went down. They've actually done a pretty good job of maintaining talent levels in those circumstances. Um, but, you know, again, if we set out the right team, we have a lot of really good, talented, athletic players. And, uh, you know, if, if we just kind of remove some of, of these, as I say, unnecessary risks, um, I, I don't see why we shouldn't have a dominant performance. That, again, that doesn't mean that we're going to win the game. It doesn't mean that we're going to, uh, you know, win four nil and absolutely hammer them. But what it does is it would re dramatically reduce the probabilities of things turning out in a in a, in a negative way. Um, so, just before we finish up and I get your predictions, uh, Philip DeMarco was asking in the comments below a while ago um, what the measurements are when it co comes up against better opposition. So obviously, Celtic's performance mm -hmm. and levels are going to be better in the league because they're coming up against lower level opposition like Ross County, like Kilmarnock. No offense to those teams, but they're not exactly Lille or AC Milan. So what do you do differently if you do anything differently, Alan, when you're looking at these? Yeah. No, that's a good, good question. I What I tended to do it's trying because because it, it Celtic actually don't play because we're in a small league. We don't actually play that many teams. <laughs> it's, we actually play a small number of opponents uh, in a season, um, so there's not a lot of variation there. And obviously, uh, Celtic, especially in the years that we've been trying to get into the Champions League, you know, when you're going, you know, literally from Hamilton on the Saturday to Barcelona on the Wednesday, that's like, you know, it's like playing a different sport almost, um, and that's a real challenge. Actually, it's a real difficult. Um, coaching mentality and how you set up the team. Um, so what, what what I used to what I do and sometimes when I'm looking at that question is um, split out the games into sort of two 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 camps really. Take all the games that are European um, because there's a huge variety. Even even in the early rounds, there's a huge variety of styles of play and and playing conditions and you know playing Reyk Reykjavik in Iceland on an artificial pitch. You know, can can be can be quite tricky. You know, so I know they're not, not a particularly well ranked team, but there's all sorts of problems to solve there. So t take the European games, take the games against, let's say, the top six in the league, and take cup semi finals and cup finals, and and call them the sort of the big games, and and look at player stats uh, in those games compared to um, you know the, their overall stats, and and what you find is um, that the, there are a few players like an Edward whose performance levels are 
<laughs> he just perform, you know, performs, or not, not so much this season, clearly, but uh, he will generally perform quite consistently, irrespective of the opponent. And then there are a lot of players, like, I mean, I mean, Griffiths would be one, I'm not picking on him particularly, but it's just one that springs to my mind, uh, where actually, you know, the weaker the opponent, the better he plays, and that's just, that's probably his level type of thing. And the harder the opponent, his figures will drop, maybe maybe 10, 15, 20%, quite a large drop-off when you start increasing the, the quality level of the of the opponent. So, so there are things that we can do, I don't have this to hand for this season, but these are the, that's the way that I would look at that problem. And as, as James mentioned, you could probably get, you know, I've not explored these ELO ratings. But that's probably a, a really good thing to do as well. You could come up with some kind of way of ranking and benchmarking based on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, one, the one thing I'll just be real quick, Ender. The, the, the one thing that I've done is looking at benchmarking um, the successful clubs that are kind of outside of the big five leagues. So, to, you know, the Portos, the Benficas, the Ajax, the uh, Salzburgs, and look at what they do domestically as far as um, their underlying performance levels compared to their opponents. So kind of average XG differential, right? So what's their XG that they're creating versus the XG that they're surrendering? And, and looking at that relative to how Celtics performing domestically. And even in, a, even in a season where we were dominant domestically, like in 17, 18, that spread uh, was nowhere near what it would need to be relative to those other teams to be competitive in Europe. Uh, so that, that's a simple way to think about it is mm -hmm. the level of domination is important <laughs> uh, from a performance perspective and how that translate. Because, you know, the Austrian league's probably a little better than Scotland, top to bottom. You know, it's maybe more parity. Uh, we're a little top heavy compared to a league like Austria. So if you look at a Salzburg um, and the level that they're, you know, hammering domestic <laughs> um, competition relative to how Celtics competing domestically and and you can benchmark that and that's i've done that and that's you know we we still need to expand that i mean even yeah. above and beyond that, that's a structural strategic issue as we look forward if we want to uh, be more relevant in europe going forward is that we need to be even more dominant domestically um and and that'll be a sign that uh we're improving levels of play uh to to maybe be able to be you know a, a legit champions league perennial uh, contender as far as getting into the, the group stage and then maybe getting into a, a knockout stage in in the Champions League again in our in our lifetimes hopefully. Yeah, well, it's it, yeah that, that I suppose that's the key issue for Celtic this year and over the last couple of years as well because I mean it's funny that you say that we need to be more dominant when it comes to domestic form when they're going for ten in a row this year, but we should be going for 10 in a row if we're being completely honest because the opponents that we're coming up against over the last 10 years were not up to scratch but and it's it's almost a double edged sword in a way because you're so dominant that how do you test yourself against better better teams when you're not coming up against those teams and then when you eventually do come up against them in Europe you're not well enough prepared and that's one of the key worries for me is that there's I know that the 10 in a row means so much to the fans but the season doesn't end after 10 in a row. Like the Scottish League still continues, the Champions League still continues, life still goes on. And Celtic have been regressing in Europe, be that in the Champions League, in the Europa League. Just look at what they did this year. I know we had a bit, a bit of a, a, a good year last year, but that was an anomaly of a year compared to what we've what we've become. We used to be a last 16 Champions League side. Now we're uh, struggling to get out of the, the group stage at Europa League side. And that's the regression in 10 years what's another 10 years going to do if teams keep getting richer but uh, that's that's a that's a rant for another day what are <laughs> what are you what are your predictions for the scottish cup final tomorrow against hearts even just performance levels uh team selection are celtic going to win it are they going to win it handily alan i'll let you have the first shot yeah i think if for me you you go with the same team that's shown control and, and that's a really important word because it's, it's, it's in stark contrast to how Celtic have played a lot of the season um, and we control defensively sound with attacking menace if we play the same team as the last two games I'm, I'm, I'll go for a solid 2-0 win if we don't play that team um, uh, it, could, it could be another 2-1 nervy game <laughs> James? Yeah, I, I would agree with Alan uh, it's, it's kind of a binary thing depending on selection uh, probably the only you know, again, the only tweak I'd like to see going into tomorrow to maybe make the the team that we've had the last two better is maybe swap out uh, from Pong for Christie. 
um, on, on the right side. But if we get the spine the same through the middle, um, I, I think, you know, two, three nil. I mean, I, I'd actually, I, barring some kind of something weird, which happens, I, we should have another clean sheet against a le this level of team. We're certainly due for a, a run of them, given the quality that we've got in, in defense and if, if Sora plays in midfield. Um, but if we don't, then, you know, I think it's a crapshoot. I, I think it's kind of a more of a 60, 40, 70, 30 kind of game, which in a one off, you know, who knows? <laughs> yeah, team team selection is going to be key here. I, I do think Celtic will win this. I think it might be some, similar enough to the Motherwell game a couple of years ago where Celtic do perform to that level. Hopefully we get a result and hopefully we get a win. But we are out of time. We are we have been the Huddle Breakdown. If you want to watch or listen to any of our stuff, you can find us on Twitter, Huddle Breakdown, or on YouTube as well. And make sure to subscribe if you want to listen to that even more. But we are here for this charity event thanks to paul john dykes for inviting us as well the four charities are again Roch talk food facts friends food bank children first and help for the homeless the link is in the description below if you want to donate any money thanks for listening to us over the last hour and enjoy the rest of the day and enjoy the cup final tomorrow i'm end the call